Hi, welcome to the second episode of my podcast, Books from Abhinav. I am Abhinav Hansa Raman, your host for this show. Through this podcast, I intend to do two things. First, I'll help you find books that are really interesting, fascinating, and hopefully unputdownable. Second, I'll try not to be pretentious and tell you what I enjoyed, what I learned, what I didn't enjoy in all of the books that I read. So the book I'm discussing today is the Cortesan, the Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin, Tales from Indian History by Manu Espillai. Manu is a very young guy who's barely 30 years old and he has four wonderful books that have come out in the last few years. There are three strong reasons why you should read Manu Pillai. First, he picks up interesting, fascinating stories. Second, his prose is so good that the stories jump out of the page right into your living room. And third, he picks up characters whose stories we normally don't get to hear. Manu's books are usually massive, with almost one third of the book covered in end end notes, telling you the rich source of archival material and other material he's using to give you the stories. Now, this does not mean that these are dense historical books which would put you to sleep very easily. On the contrary, the insane amount of trivia that's filled in every book is just brilliant. For example, in his latest book, False Allies, Manu was just trying to make a point about this Indian prince who was posing with a tricycle to show that he was far more westernized than his counterparts. But look at the footnotes he's used to tell you this guy. He tells you that this man was painted holding a salvo quad tricycle, which is exactly what the Queen of England had at that point of time. He takes you to the equations between bicycle enthusiasts and tricycle enthusiasts, because at that point of time, tricycle enthusiasts or the Tricyclists Association in London demanded special privileges in the city's parks. They argued that tricycle enthusiasts were patently superior to the boards and mortals who rode bicycles. Now, who could have imagined that in a book about Indian princes and the Imperial Raj, he would refer to a book called The Story of the Bicycle uh, published by Rutledge in 1970. Enough about the author, now let's move into this book. This book has a really, really pretty cover. And again, why I did buy it on Kindle, because I ended up going to an event where this man was signing his books. I also ended up picking up up a hard copy and I'm really happy about it. Because dude, look at this cover, it's damn pretty, right? The book is divided into two major parts. One is the period which precedes the British Raj in India. And the second, of course, is the period of the British Raj in India. The book starts in 1623, talking about a venerated sannyasi who finds himself in Tamil Nadu. He receives the governor's welcome, accommodation in the finest quarters of the city, and most importantly, the promise of the friendship of the governor. But unlike other sannyasis, he was a white man. Like any rebellious teenager born to a fine Italian family, he quarrelled with his family and decided to serve the Catholic Church. While his main campaign in India was to convert more people to Christianity, he had to really adapt himself to the social and cultural mores of the land he found himself in. To that extent, he decided to convert himself into the priestly class of Tamil Nadu, and there he lived like the Brahmins of Tamil Nadu did. While other missionaries were chastised for being unclean firangis, his conversion to the ways of the land meant that he had far more reach and far more cultural acceptance. Of course, while his adoption of the caste system and other problematic things were a huge fault, he had gained widespread acceptance. While there were only 23 Christians before he came in 1610, in the years that he lived in Tamil Nadu, his flock rose to around 4,000 people. Now for a single man, that is massive impact. The book then moves to the story of Shahuji Bonsle, a Maratha prince in Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu, who writes very provocative plays. After this comes the story of a Muslim deity in a Hindu temple. Why this is not a story with historical backing, it tells you about the way we told stories to ourselves back in the 14th century. He identifies two parallels, one from Srirangam near Trichy, where I come from, and the other from Melkote Trinarayanapuram temple in Karnataka, where there are parallel stories of Muslim women becoming devotees of a Hindu lord. A central thread connecting all of these stories, and one major thing that I think the book tries to do, is to challenge our assumptions and understanding of how we think Indian history works, or how Indian society continues to work even today. Be it notions on how cultures operate, interact with each other, on how religion and politics played against and played towards the same cause, counterfactuals on what would have happened, say, if the Vijayanagara Empire had continued, what if the British Raj never happened to India, 
This book makes you think, if nothing else. Particularly in terms of the Hindu-Muslim divide that continues to plague our country to this day, this book makes you introspect and think about a lot of things. Sure, politics and religion have been used by kings to win battles, but how does it really play out in life? For example, in the Raya Vachakamu, which is ostensibly about Krishna Deva Raya and his reign, the rhetoric used against Muslims is a rhetoric that we see to this day. Like the idea of them being cow killers, drunkards and barbarians was indeed used in this book back in the day to praise a Hindu king. But if you look at the history of the Deccan Sultanates and beyond the confines of their religions, these kings and princes often spent time growing up as a young man in the kingdom of other rivals and their alliances were far larger than what religion would have permitted them to do. The larger points that the book makes aside, it's a very easy and fun read because the chapters are usually 2 to 5 pages. And they're so interesting that even if you just pick up, want to read something for 5 to 10 minutes, you can easily finish a couple of chapters and get back to whatever work you were doing. The book is done. Now to the next segment of this podcast. Interesting trivia. Let's say you're a tire manufacturer in the 1900s. You see that there are barely any cars out in Europe and you want more people to buy cars who would consequently buy more tires and therefore your business would start booming. Now you think about how do you provide value to these customers of cars. So you publish a booklet where you tell them what tires are good, how to change tires, what routes are good. If you're driving through France and you want to go to a new restaurant, what's a nice restaurant to go to? In your rating system, you tell them it's a one star restaurant. If the restaurant is a fine dining establishment worth going to, you tell them it's a two star restaurant. If you should make a detour from the journey you're taking, particularly to go to that restaurant. And then it's a three-star restaurant if you must go to that restaurant at all costs. Now slowly, as time passes, your restaurant rating system becomes very popular. So popular that more than the tires you manufacture, the name you have with the book, which is essentially what is now known as the Michelin star rating system, becomes so popular that restaurants all across the world are dying to get your ratings. And that is the history of how the world got the Michelin star rating system. I hope you enjoyed listening to the second episode of my podcast, Books from Abhinav. Tune into my podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Google Podcasts every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. If you like the books I recommend and the interesting trivia that I shared on my podcast, please check out my blog, Abhinav's blog, which is ahansaraman.wordpress.com and my newsletter, ahansaraman.substack.com. It is A-H-A-N-S-A-R-A-M-A-N. Thank you for tuning in. Have a nice day. But wait, this video is not over. I am very excited and happy to announce that soon on my blog and my newsletter, I will be publishing a written interview with the author of this book, Manu S. So please do check out my blog and my newsletter. Thank you.